the deer and the bowman, or the hart and the hunter. The hart was once drinking from a pool and admiring the noble figure he made there. Ah, said he, where can you see such noble horns as these, with such antlers? I wish I had legs more worthy to bear such a noble crown. It's a pity they're so slim and slight. At that moment, a hunter approached and sent an arrow whistling after him. Away bounded the hart, and soon, with the aid of his nimble legs, was nearly out of sight of the hunter. But not noticing where he was going, he passed under some trees with branches growing low down in which his antlers were caught, so that the hunter had time to come up. Alas, alas, cried the hart. The moral that Aesop sends us through the ages. We often despise what is most useful to us. Another way to say that is we can get caught up focusing on the wrong things and not see our own strengths. Today we'll talk about a few high-yield syndromes we should know in the ED. Enough to understand the challenges, lean into the strengths of the patient and his or her caregivers to see the forest clearly and not get caught up in the trees. You make tough calls when caring for acutely ill and injured children. Join us for strategy and support through clinical cases, research, and reviews, and best practice guidance in our ever-changing acute care landscape. This is your Pediatric Emergency Playbook. Welcome to the Playbook. I'm your host and coach, Tim Horechko. We're not geneticists in the ED. We can't know and shouldn't be expected to know all of the ins and outs of any given syndrome. We should know the emergent considerations to the more common genetic syndromes. And we'll add in a few more just to boost our confidence level. In this episode, we'll talk about Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome, Marfan syndrome, Treacher Collins, achondroplasia, Sturge Weber, osteogenesis imperfecta, DeGeorge syndrome, trisomy 21, and spina bifida, what we need to give our best care in the emergency department. This episode will be part essential just-in-time knowledge and part clinical enrichment. Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome is the most common overgrowth disorder, and it also carries an increased cancer risk. These children are born big. They have an above-average birth weight, the so-called large for gestational age. After birth, they have an accelerated growth, or macrosomia. These children will often have a large tongue, so macroglossia. Aha, uh -huh, am I getting your attention now? These children have a large BMI, disproportionate growth, and an abnormal airway. All of them are difficult intubations. In the newborn period, these babies present with neonatal hypoglycemia. Later, they may have persistently low blood sugars because of hyperinsulinism. You may also see distinctive grooves in the earlobes, ear creases and ear pits, and even some facial anomalies. As an overgrowth syndrome, you may also see abnormal enlargement of one side or one structure of the body called lateralized overgrowth, resulting in asymmetric stature or growth. Abdominal wall defects and umbilical hernias are common. These patients come in for a variety of issues related to the syndrome itself, and the more vague the presentation, the more I worry. Children with Beckwith-Wiedemann have an increased risk of developing cancers, especially Wilms tumor and hepatoblastoma. Such is the range of presentations that Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome has recently been reclassified as Beckwith-Wiedemann spectrum because the clinical presentation can vary from patient to patient. Since the overgrowth can affect any organ system, these children, like many with genetic syndromes, have a whole team of specialists, including geneticists, plastic surgeons, endocrinologists, nephrologists, pulmonologists, all of them to try to help coordinate and navigate their care. It's standard for them to get routine, regular screening renal and abdominal ultrasounds. Mm -hmm. 
Marfan syndrome is a funny thing. It may be diagnosed at birth because of an obvious complication, or it may go undiagnosed until some astute clinician, maybe you, puts it all together when the older child or adolescent presents with something just out of the ordinary. Marfan syndrome is a problem with fibrillin, which normally serves to limit the growth of long bones and elastic structures in the body. This is why patients are unusually tall and slender. In most people, your arm span is just shorter than your height. So with your arms at 90 degrees in abduction, the distance from middle fingertip to middle fingertip should be just under your height. In people with Marfan syndrome, their arm span is just above their height. They also might have pectus excavatum, so funnel or sunken chest, or pectus carinatum, pigeon chest. The thumb sign is seen when the person can adduct his long, slender thumb so far that it passes over the full palm and peeks out past the small finger. The wrist sign is when the person wraps his hand around his own wrist and the thumb overlaps with a small finger. People with Marfan syndrome are affected in varying degrees, and sometimes the findings are not so obvious in early childhood. Scoliosis is common, and so is a high-arched palate with crowded teeth. We think of Marfan's as very flexible, but the one odd man out is a reduced extension of the elbows. The reason to be on the lookout is that maybe that tall, lanky teenager is coming in complaining of chest pain, and you want to call it ah, anxiety, but think for a moment. Look at his chest. Look at his habitus. Again, not all people with Marfans fit the perfect stereotype. Chest pain in a patient with Marfans, or truly even someone with a first-degree relative of someone with Marfans. Remember, this is an autosomal dominant gene. All of this should be taken very seriously because of the risk that it connotes. Up to 80% of children with Marfan syndrome will have some dilatation of the aortic root. So now we're talking emergency medicine. Dissection, pneumothorax, core pulmonale, they're all players here. Also, these children suffer often from cataracts or early glaucoma. Lens dislocation and retinal nerve detachment are not uncommon. So in Marfan's patients, or truly anyone you suspect might need a workup for Marfan syndrome, take these complaints to the next level. Treacher Collins is a relatively rare syndrome characterized by distinct facies that includes underdevelopment of the zygomatic complex, the palate, and the mouth. Chronically, these children have trouble with infections and feeding, and acutely, it's another difficult airway. You may see a downward slant of the palpebral fissures and external and middle ear abnormalities. These children often have hearing loss. The cranial cavity is limited, and they have varying degrees of microcephaly and potentially psychomotor delay. A typical patient that you may see is a young infant who is having difficulty breathing from an upper respiratory tract infection. When you evaluate the airway, you'll see a hypoplastic maxilla making the midface appear flat or sunken. The mandible is not completely developed, so this is the so-called mandibular hypoplasia. The chin itself may be small as well, or micronathia. This child often has obstructive sleep apnea, mostly because of the facial abnormalities rather than because of the tonsils or the body habitus. Similarly, the Pierre Robin sequence can be found in a number of genetic syndromes, including Treacher Collins, but also in DeGeorge syndrome, Pattaya syndrome, and others. The only distinguishing characteristics between the phenotype in Treacher Collins and in Pierre Robin is mandible length. In Treacher Collins, the ramus is short, but the mandible is normal. In Pierre Robin, the mandible is short and the ramus is small. These are just some little tidbits to ponder as you prep your backup LMA. You'll also see glossotosis. The tongue is tethered further back in the mouth and a cleft palate. 
To make things even more complicated, these children may have coanal atresia, so their nares are small, making a nasal trumpet difficult and bag mask ventilation challenging. You may also have trouble communicating with these children. They have conductive hearing loss because of their bony abnormalities, or they may have malformed or absent ossicles. The outer ears may look crumpled or rotated. You may see ear pits or skin tags. All of these are outward signs of difficulty in processing information. Children with treacher Collins syndrome have a downward slant, as we mentioned, to the palpebral fissures, but they also might have a notch in their eyelid or even a cleft of missing eyelid tissue called an eyelid coloboma. They may be missing eyelashes. This is a good setup for irritation or dry eye. Children may also have narrow tear ducts or dacrostenosis. Some children will need cleft palate surgery as an infant or toddler. They'll need zygomatic and orbital reconstruction as a preschooler, potentially jawbone reconstruction or mandibular distraction. It can be any time from infancy to teenage, depending on the severity of their malformation. The idea there is to lengthen the jawbone over time. So it's not uncommon for you to see a child with Treacher Collins present with uh, post-surgical problems, or maybe even with a tracheostomy or a gastrostomy tube. Think about all of the trouble with insipation of concretions in the, in the tracheostomy tube. Think about dislodgement, obstruction, or tracheitis. Achondroplasia is a great example of the challenge in helping people with genetic conditions. The balance between overreacting and underreacting. Achondroplasia is a type of dwarfism. The less common type is proportional dwarfism, where a child might have small stature with proportionate limbs, usually a growth hormone problem. The more common disproportionate dwarfism is when the child is born with a normal torso but shorter arms and legs. There are very many subtypes, but today we'll focus on the most common type that you'll see in the ED achondroplasia, a type of disproportionate dwarfism. This is about 80% of cases. Now, we all know about the growth plate and its role in helping bones to lengthen. Recall that it's the chondrocytes that grow at the end plate, they hypertrophy, and then they signal, hey, I'm ready to be ossified, as more chondrocytes grow behind them. Achondroplasia is a bit of a misnomer. It's not a complete lack of this function, just a very limited signal to the growth plates in the longitudinal bones. Hence, normal axial skeleton, a normal torso height, just shorter extremities. Our challenge in helping these patients is keeping a balanced approach. On the one hand, older children and adults with achondroplasia lead normal lives and can be seen as any other patient with an emergency condition. In the infant, toddler, and young child phase of their lives, though, they're at their most vulnerable. You may see macrocephaly, frontal or parietal bossing, or mid-face retrusion. The chest is usually small and the chest wall is overly compliant. You may see paradoxical movement with respiration. In an unaffected child, a child without dwarfism, this is a sign of respiratory distress. These are retractions. In an achondroplastic dwarf, this is normal. So be extra careful what you're calling respiratory distress. But then again, don't blow it off if you're unsure. Even as older children, an overly compliant chest wall means little recoil, so a decreased functional residual capacity and essentially a functionally restrictive lung disease. Their elbows are often stiff with limited range of motion. Hips and knees may be hypermobile. Careful with the trauma patient here. You may need extra films or projections to be sure there are no deformities after injury. Probably the most striking finding is that babies with achondroplasia are often misdiagnosed as floppy. It's true that infants and toddlers have some degree of hypotonia that will resolve with age, but that in combination with their hypermobility may make them seem sicker than they really are. It's important in these cases to engage the family and their thoughts and impression of 
what they see and what you're seeing so that you can form your own informed impression. Critical illness or trauma need extra care in a chondroplast. Intubation shouldn't be affected, even though the midface appears smaller. It's very easy to hyperextend the cervical spine, so watch out for that, especially in trauma. Vascular access can be a bit problematic because of extra subcutaneous fat concentrations. Patients with achondroplasia can have hydrocephalus, cervical medullary compression, and thoracolumbar stenosis, all making this more susceptible for them to have spinal cord injury. Sturge Weber syndrome is a vascular trickster. Babies may be born with a port wine birthmark that is just the tip of the iceberg of the vascular anomalies hiding in the face and cranium. This is a neurocutaneous syndrome that can involve the skin, the brain, the spinal cord, and the eyes. The first tip off to the parents is a nevius flamius or a port wine birthmark on the face. Now that's all fine, but when you see a child with a port wine birthmark in any presentation of headache, change in behavior, altered mental status, or seizures, think hemorrhagic stroke. You'll manage the airway and treat the seizures initially as you normally would, but these children need immediate neuroimaging. These children may also need neurosurgery if their seizures don't abate, up to and including vagal nerve stimulation, focal cortical resection, or even hemispherectomy. clippel trenoné syndrome presents similarly to Sturge-Weber, but for our purposes, let's just say that the concerns for nevius flamius and seizures are the same in both. <music> Osteogenesis imperfecta is brittle bone disease. There are many subtypes, but none of that is really relevant to us. We aren't making that diagnosis in the ED. But what we will see is the poor little toddler who is just being a toddler, but comes in after a ground level fall, but actually has a fracture. Hopefully the parents tell you what's going on, but We've all been there, right? Either through their exhaustion or frustration or distraction, or they think that you must just know you don't get that history. Not everyone with osteogenesis imperfecta will have blue sclera. Some have mild symptoms, some are severe. Okay, I can feel you getting a little antsy here. Fine, here you go. Type 1 is the most common and the most mild. Type 2 is the most severe, and then the other types 3 through 21 are less common and more detailed. In summary, type 1, mild, most common, blue sclera. All right, that should give you your board level fix. Anyway, in the ED, of course, we film anything and everything that may constitute a fracture, but think also about all of the soft tissue uh, injuries that you ha can have when collagen is a problem. These children also have impaired lung function and cardiac function. They usually have a triangular shaped face and are shorter than average. Scoliosis is common. They have hyperextendable joints. They bruise easily. They have brittle teeth and babies will often have hypotonia. So mostly you'll see the child who is at risk for fractures. The sad, cynical face of osteogenesis imperfecta is in the case of non-accidental trauma. Defense attorneys love to put children through unnecessary workups to prove that the normal child simply has brittle bone disease and was not abused. Typically, this is an inpatient issue, but beware of that sad note. DeGeorge syndrome is when a child is born with either underdevelopment of the thymus or no thymus at all. Let's break it down. Your thymus is like immunologic kindergarten. It's where you learn all about how to deal with everyone else. A good foundation to defend yourself going forward. The thymus is critical in your adaptive immune system. Everything you ever needed to know, you learned in kindergarten, but also everything your adaptive immune system 
is was based on what was learned through the important microenvironment that was your thymus. So not only is the thymus helpful in teaching and nurturing your B cells and your T cells to react to pathogens and to sound the alarm of your immune system, but it also has to do a lot with tolerance. It serves a critical role in what not to react to and therefore your risk of developing an autoimmune disease. Now, I say what your thymus was because it's all been replaced by fat. We can all relate. Anyway, only 1% of children with DeGeorge have no thymus whatsoever, a thymia. Most have some attenuation of thymic function, and everyone is at risk for viral or fungal or bacterial infections. In older children and adolescents, it's important to get a good hospitalization history to find out how affected that particular individual is. Some people go through life relatively unaffected, and some fight infection after infection. Take a moment to find out what we know about your individual patient's history. Infants are especially at risk for opportunistic infections and have a harder time fighting them off. Some infants are born with a larger charge syndrome of coloboma, heart defects, coenal atresia, growth retardation, and ear abnormalities. In the spectrum, some but not all may also have hypoparathyroidism, and so of course we worry about hypocalcemia. Many will have laryngomalacia and noisy breathing that doesn't necessarily connote respiratory distress. So a few patient encounters with DeGeorge, a three-month-old with status epilepticus. Only the paramedics are here, and all you know is that the blood sugar is normal. You don't know anything else about this child. You treat them with everything you've got, and he's still seizing. The sodium on the iStat is normal. Could it be hypocalcemia? Oh, there's no thymic silhouette on the chest x-ray. Give the calcium. Or a school-aged child with uh, known to George syndrome has a URI. He's mildly febrile, a little more tachycardic than you want. Send him home? He is immunocompromised, so maybe think twice there. Or the adolescent or adult that says, oh yeah, I had something called to George, but I'm fine. And they may be mostly right. Your thymus will have learned what it can and will have done its job by adolescence when it becomes functionally silent. With age, it's replaced by fatty tissue. So just remember, not every locality will include newborn screening for severe combined immunodeficiency. You can't just verify no thymus by chest x-ray and be sure about it. You would need specialized testing that you're not going to get, like flow cytometry for T-cell numbers. So you may just be the first one on the scent of the T-cell trail. Trisomy 21, or Down syndrome. It's not uncommon, and I'm sure we're all familiar. In the emergency department, it's important to remember the acute and ongoing considerations for children with Down syndrome. When we think of atlantoaxial instability, we often think of trauma. And for sure, any child with Down syndrome and anything other than minor trauma, please keep that in mind. But much of the morbidity of atlantoaxial instability is actually non-traumatic, and it can be a total fake-out for us with disastrous consequences. The atlantoaxial joint is very mobile, and it allows for 50% of the normal rotation of the cervical spine, but it should only participate in 10 degrees of flexion and extension. It's mobile, which means it's also structurally weak, even in non-affected individuals. Since children with Down syndrome have hyperflexibility of their joints, this is no exception. Even mild upper respiratory infections can cause some retropharyngeal edema and ligamentous laxity since the anterior arch of the atlas is only millimeters away from the posterior border of the hypopharynx. The scary thing is the slow slippage that can occur over time and unrecognized until they come to see you with signs and symptoms of spinal cord injury, 
that are subtle and maybe harder to recognize in a child with special needs. These symptoms include neck pain or clumsiness or sensory deficits or even worsening abnormal gait. Torticollis, which we think of as benign in an unaffected toddler, can be devastating in a child with Down syndrome. A slow onset of vague symptoms that don't seem like an emergency at the time can result in paraplegia. Children with Down syndrome are also at risk for developing seizures, diabetes mellitus, intestinal obstruction, and relative immunodeficiency. The more vague and non-straightforward the complaint with the child with Down syndrome, truthfully, a lot of these syndromes that we talked about, needs a bit more thought. Maybe that means just close follow-up, or maybe that means it's up to you today to try to figure things out before they escalate. Some other sneaky things about Down syndrome is the association with myeloproliferative disorders and leukemia. So you may see fatigue, pallor, night sweats, bony pain, easy bruising, loss of appetite. All of those are symptoms. A quick little review in context, you'll see that acute myeloid leukemia is the most common in children ages one to four. Acute Megakaryoblastic leukemia is rare, but it's the type that often occurs in children specifically with Down syndrome. Acute lymphoid leukemia, ALL, is the most common in children ages 2 to 6, but of course it can develop at any age. So AML is less common in children in general, but when it does happen, it's usually in younger infants and toddlers. ALL is the most common in children and is usually in toddlers and preschoolers. And AMKL, the acute megakaryoblastic leukemia, is the most common type in Down syndrome. Unfortunately, children with Down syndrome are forever at higher risk for ALL throughout their lives. And they all often will suffer from early onset Alzheimer's. It's another scourge of trisomy 21. <music> You've seen this before, or at least looked for it a few times. It's that thing where your organs are low-key flipped on the other side of your body, NBD. Cartagener syndrome is really all about the ciliary dyskinesia that is associated with it, and not so much the rearrangement of the organs, but that's not as popular at parties. You'll see situs inverses totalis a mirror image reversal of internal organs. So the problem here, again, is not so much where you find the liver or where the heart's pointing. It's really the association with that ciliary dyskinesia. You have cilia in your respiratory tract, your sinuses, your middle ear, even in your reproductive organs. This is a good example of not focusing on the wrong thing what we need to do is stop staring at how the heart is not pointing in the right direction on chest x-ray and realize that these children are at much higher risk for bacterial infections of the lungs, the middle ear, the sinuses. The typical cough, cold, you seem okay, expecto veronum doesn't really work on situs inversus totalis. These children just don't clear their secretions or mucus. Be extra careful and culture what you can and my advice is to err on the side of treatment for bacterial causes. They just don't have a good defense against the phlegm arts. Spina bifida is the most common neural tube defect. It's usually an isolated finding, but can be part of a syndrome. A meningocele is a sac containing CSF that pushes through the defect in the spine. The spinal cord is in its normal place in the spinal canal, and the skin over the meningocele often is open. A myelomeningocele happens when everything pushes through the defect, including the spinal cord. Obviously, this is a more severe case. Open neural tube defects, even after closure, will have lifelong shunts to control brain swelling and they may have problems walking and controlling their bladder and bowels. Such is the importance of early repair that the ex utero intrapartum treatment, also called the exit procedure, was developed to repair the child while the fetal circulation via the umbilical cord is maintained. 
It's similar to a C-section, but the surgery is performed before the umbilical cord is cut. A newer, less invasive approach called fetoscopic repair is a pioneering, minimally invasive procedure in which two tiny four millimeter incisions are made in the uterus and a fetoscope is inserted. Basically, it's like laparoscopic repair of the myelomeningeal seal while the mother is still carrying the child. Anyway, the child with spina bifida will have long-term issues and you'll be sensitive to the possibilities of shunt malfunction or frequent UTIs. Where we can really make a big impact is in spina bifida occulta, where the defect is hidden under a layer of skin that covers the opening of the bones of the spine. It can be found by exam. Or what are we looking for? That little tuft of hair there, or a dimple. It may be found just incidentally or radiographically, even on plain films. Now, if there are no symptoms in spina bifida occulta, then there's no problem. The patient just needs close follow-up. But if there are any signs or symptoms of a tethered cord in the older child or adolescent, so back pain, sciatica symptoms, unexplained weakness or numbness of the legs, a bladder issue, really any weird lower extremity complaint in anyone, examine that back. It may not be spina bifida occulta, with its hair tuft or dimple or fatty mass, but you'll be glad you looked. The emergency department is the front door to the hospital, and it's the back door to the health system. We need to be ready for the life-threatening presentations of anyone, including those children with special needs. But we can be even more empowered to be knowledgeable about all of the complications that can be helped and minimized if we have just a bit more knowledge about them. So in summary, and forgive my glibness, it's all done for effect, beckwith Wiedemann syndrome, neonatal hypoglycemia, macrosomia, a difficult airway. Basically, a big, long-distance trucker dude trapped in a baby's body. Marfan syndrome. That tall, lanky kid may just have an aortic dissection or pneumothorax or even a lens dislocation. He may not be phenotypically obvious. Treacher Collins syndrome. Micronathia, a truly difficult airway. You need a backup setup and maybe even OR induction. Achondroplasia. Babies look floppy, but often they're not. Careful when they're critically ill, they can decompensate quickly and vascular access can be difficult. Sturge Weber. Vascular ticking time bombs. Osteogenesis imperfecta. Look for the fracture you missed. DeGeorge syndrome. A spectrum of thymic underdevelopment immunocompromise, or maybe even hypocalcemia causing seizures. Trisomy 21, atlantoaxial instability, maybe even slow onset neural findings, careful with trauma, leukemia and diabetes mellitus. Cartagener syndrome, ciliary dyskinesia, worry about not being able to clear secretions. Spina bifida, shunt problems, UTIs, Spina bifida occulta, no symptoms, no problem, but watch for that tethered cord. Now, this is not a comprehensive list by any means, but these are some of the high-yield syndromes that will help you to take better care of our little patients. When you hear vague symptoms in a child with a syndrome, remember that we often despise that which is most useful to us. Get a good history. Ask those questions, get more information, get more comfortable. Don't run from your nimble legs. Use them to see the forest clearly and not get caught up in the trees. And remember, until next time, you are the champion for the child in front of you.
Take care. Thank you for listening to The Playbook. We welcome your comments, questions, and feedback. Email Tim at coach at PEMplaybook.org or drop by our website for show notes and more strategy at PEMplaybook.org. See you there.